Good afternoon. My name is Uta Poiger, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities at Northeastern. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our seventh annual and second virtual undergraduate research forum, Research That Matters. It's really a great pleasure to welcome the students who are presenting today, our panelists, to welcome our moderators for today's session, to welcome our audience, and also to extend a special welcome to all of you who are joining us who have recently been admitted to Northeastern. Special congratulations to you, and we very much hope that you enjoy the interactions about the important work that our students are doing together with our faculty members and get a sense of the broad range of issues that students and faculty tackle as part of our mission in the experiential liberal arts. Again, this is always a high point of our spring semester. And I'm very glad that so many of you student presenters are eager to put your work out to this broader audience. I also, again, want to extend a special welcome um, to our moderators who will be guiding us through the sessions and to no, I'm good. Say, and say a thank you um, to everybody who has supported putting this together, Laura Green, who's been in the lead, as well as Gabby Fiorenza and Jen Grieve, who have supported our technologies. Again, a warm welcome from me. I very much look forward to hearing from each of the presenters and also hearing the discussion, which will be guided by our moderators. Of course, the chat is open to you in that context as well. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to our first moderator for this afternoon, Professor Ryan Cordell, who is an associate professor in the English department with a particular focus on the digital humanities. Professor Cordell, can I turn over the microphone and the floor over to you? Thank you, Dean Poiger. I'm happy to, to see everyone here and eager to get started. So I'm going to just jump right in with our first speaker on panel one, who will be uh, Aaron Cuchineo, who is in international affairs and cultural anthropology. Hello, um, I'm going to show my screen. All right, um, I'm zooming in from Boston, um, so not too far. Um, I've been working on this research with Professor, Le um, Professor Weinstein from the Department of Anthropology and Sociology for the past couple of years. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so our research is focused on the four, four major cities in India, Mumbai, Bangalore, and Delhi and Hyderabad, where we focused on understanding the justifications and criticisms of slum evictions. We asked what narratives are used to justify these evictions and what narratives are used to criticize those justifications and the evictions themselves. We then wondered how, if at all, these narratives are related to one another. We combed through 450 Times of India articles which concerned slum evictions between the years of 1980 and 2019. I read the articles one by one, pulling quotes from each to categorize them into different narratives and after this process is completed, we tallied the narratives to create quantitative data out of the qualitative, um, giving us visual tools to see the prevalence of certain narratives and how they were related if they were. Um, so the most consistent and most popular government narratives for justifying evictions over time were that the slums were either illegal or that they needed to be demolished for infrastructural or environmental reasons. These arguments are easily the most consistent and most popular as they are lawfully allowed um, by officials to use for those evictions. Um, there are other narratives as well, though, including ethnic other, as in um, the people living in the slum or of a different ethnic minority that is um, unwanted by the government, um, or beauty and competitiveness, which is saying we need to make this city look beautiful and competitive with the world. Um, that served as sort of additions to these top narratives. Um, they were much less, likely, mess, much less likely to be the de jure reason for demolition, but they may in fact be the de facto reason for a demolition. Um, but something that isn't present in the, in the, um, just a second, sorry. Um, something that isn't present in this bar graph um, is that although all of these quotes listed here are in the illegal narrative of justifying an eviction, 
they have slightly different connotations. Um, at first in the 80s, it was very focused on the people themselves as illegal encroachers taking over land that didn't belong to them. But over time, there grew a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate occupiers of a space, otherwise thought of as innocent and guilty slum dwellers. Um, today, there's a focus on the technical aspects of um, illegality, much more so than moral judgment as it used to be. Um, and I argue that this has been influenced by a somewhat consistent criticism of the government's treatment of the poor and of equating poverty with criminality. Um, the most prevalent counter narratives over time were that the demolitions were either inhumane and or um, born of illegality or corruption on the part of the government. Um, so these narratives are used to say what is wrong with what the government's doing. Um, they're logically the most popular discourses because they tend, they need to directly counter by the very nature of being a counter narrative, um, what the prevalent discourses from the government are. Um, counter narratives must respond to the dominant narratives. Uh, if the government mainly says that slums are illegal or in the way of infrastructural or environmental concerns, the activists will point to any illegal or corrupt action the government takes pointing the illegality back at them and leveling the playing field. For example, saying they didn't um, give sufficient notice before undertaking a demolition. Um, the activists also harness the narrative of inhumanity as it makes most common sense, that it's inhumane to take away the very little the poor have and to treat the poor as though they are less human, less than human. Um, in conjunction with the most prevalent counter narratives, there are many others, including um, government failure and distorted development, which often point to government, government bigotry and hypocrisy. Um, here, an activist letter criticizes multiple government narratives at once. Corruption and illegality on the part of the government in this housing scam, distorted development in prioritizing the rich over the poor, and using that point to the inhumanity, using that point to in, um, point to the inhumanity slum dwellers must face in having no other option but to live in slums that the government calls illegal. Um, there is no way to be poor and legal in this system. Um, there are some, ca some counter narratives that we found to be particularly effective um, in terms of prevalence in the data. Um, as you can see in the graph, um, in the early 1980s, this dominant narrative, this government narrative of beautifying the city as a justification for slum evictions um, was peaking in the um, uh, or the later 80s and then kind of falls over time um, until it intersects with the previously uh, dipping distorted development counter narrative. Um, then you see that when the distorted development narrative finally responds to the beauty narrative, that beauty narrative falls, um, pointing to the fact that that might be an effective um, counter narrative. Um, this indicates that there's a lag of response from the counter narrative, although there is an initial increased pushback from the dominant, um, the distorted development narrative seems to be effective in curbing that beauty narrative over time. So the main takeaways um, from this part of our data um, were that firstly, discourses may change over time, but evictions seem to remain consistent. Um, they will persist through and find new discourses to use. Um, secondly, while official narratives tend to drive the story, activist counter narratives are consistently reacting, though there's sometimes a lag. Um, thirdly, there's evidence that these counter narratives can cause a change in, gover in government narratives, as seen in the shifting nuance of illegality and the diminished beauty narrative. Um, they can also create policy changes, as seen in, especially in Mumbai, where spontaneous evictions, where there's um, no warning, no re rehabilitation for slum dollars, have almost gone completely extinct and rehabilitation is almost standard, though it's very, very flawed. Um, lastly, though we set out um, with the ultimate goal of turning the qualitative data into quantitative data to draw conclusions, um, we've learned that both are necessary to understanding the nuance. Through the qualitative data, um, we learn the nuances and through the quantitative, we learn the pattern um, in the discourses over time. Thank you very much. I'm excited to answer questions at the end. <laughs> How do I uh, thank you, Aaron. So, I we have a question for Aaron. So we'll take that during the uh, during the Q and A time. I just want to remind our presenters that was uh, that was very quick. We uh, make sure to 
speak slowly, ar ar articulate so that everyone can and follow along, please. Um, so the next speaker for our next group for our panel will be Brittany Claudi from Politics, Philosophy, and Economics, and Leilana Mitchell from the College of Art, Media, and Design. Now we'll turn things over to them. Thank you, everyone. So Leilana and I will be presenting our project entitled Marginal Bodies, Women of Color Representation and the Struggle Over Citizenship and Belonging from 1920 to 2020. Um, we're working with Professor Patricia Davis, who was housed between CAMD and CSSH on this project um, in preparation for her book project. So just to give a little breakdown, we'll give you guys some background information on the project, um, a brief description, our goals, our examples slash takeaways, um, the exhibition layout, and then questions at the end of the panel. So I wanted to start off by giving an example of a quote from one of the texts that we will be drawing from. Um, this is by Melissa Harris Perry, who's a political science professor. Um, and she wrote her book entitled Sister Citizen, which documents um, racist stereotypes of black women throughout the 20th and 21st century. And she says, it can be hard to stand up in a cricket room, which references the ways in which black women have tried to make sense of the world, of, of, their, um, of the world in their terms. So to provide a background um, and description of our project, it aims to create an exhibition centered on issues of African-American women's representation of media, including television, print advertising, and Black-centered newspapers and, and same magazines. And we want to kind of create, a, create an ex a historical approach with the specific goal of tracing and documenting the evolution of images that contributed to the marginalization of African-American women from, dom from dominant conceptions of citizenship in the US. So we can see that these images of women, of black women belonging have manifested in contemporary social inequities that include healthcare, education and voting um, and violence. And our images are sourced from a resistant perspective. So seeing how black women have resisted these notions that deny them citizenship and belonging. And our text, we will include text within the exhibition to um, that adopts a critical approach of analyzing these images and drawing from secondary sources. So um, the exhibition is going to connect current um, social political discourse from Black Lives Matter protests, and as well as their historical precursors, including um, the civil rights movement. And some of the places that we are getting our images from include the Schoenberg Center for Black Culture in Harlem, the Duke University Access Project digital collection, um, the Marble or Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library in Atlanta, Georgia, Auburn Re Avenue Research Library and other sources such as New York Times and um, at the Atlanta Journal. So our goals of the project is to one, provide a theoretical foundation of research of black feminist scholars who have focused on the ways that the body has been an important site of how social constructions work. We also wanna provide a visual timeline that offers a historical context for black women's representation. Um, and we also want the exhibition to situate within contemporary struggles that address racial inequities that have happened throughout um, the 20th, 21st century. And we want to kind of provide a way for visitors to learn more about the historical foundations of our, of our racial inequities. In the exhibition, um, locations that we're in contact with right now include Ryder Hall, um, the John D. O'Brien African American Institute, and the Andrew Quad in Curry. So just to give some examples of um, the kinds of images that we'll be using and the kinds of ideas that we'll be drawing from that include, um, for example, this image on the, on the left of me, which is um, a picture of a light-skinned woman as, um, who is a model who has graced the cover of Ebony Magazine during the 20th century. Um, so something I'm currently trying to make sense of is how um, the first image of a light-skinned woman like why is she the cover and why is she more acceptable to be the cover? Um, also thinking about how, what her lighter skin says about her proximity to whiteness and its implications about enjoying the merits that are usually reserved for white people. So the second image is of Barbara Watson. She is a model during the 20th century and um, she's also light skin. And if you look closely at the text, she is actually hosting lectures of African-American women um, from different kinds of communities and backgrounds and trying to help them with lectures and boot camps to develop um, feminine beauty. 
And there's something to be said about how a lighter skinned woman evokes this idea of true femininity and how she um, is legitimate in giving these lectures to other black women as well. Um, Harris Perry talks about this in the book Sister Citizen when she says, respectability politics implies that women's ability to work on behalf of black communities and demand fair and just treatment from the state res rested on their sterling moral character. So it kind of shows how respectability politics as a form of resistance from negative tropes that were um, put on black people during this time period. And the last image is of um, um, a house worker during the 20th century as well, who it says, my old black mammy. And um, I want to read a little excerpt from, from um, the book as well, where she says, um, African-American women as mammy served to challenge critics who argue that slavery and harsh was harsh and demeaning. After all, they were depicted as happy and content with their duties. So you can see here that she looks pretty happy. And this image was probably lived within somebody's family archives. So it shows like how close she was to the family and how her ideas of like her, her behavior kind of continue to, per to perpetuate this idea that black, black people were happy with their, with their subjugation. So connecting this historical to contemporary, um, there are two images that kind of have the same kind of meaning. From the first one, you can see that um, it's during the civil rights movement, it's of a black woman. And if you look closely, you can see that she's actually pushing the rifle or like the gun out of, from, from her face. Um, and the second image, you can see that she's much more like, you know, solid in her demeanor. So these two images represent um, direct resistance from police and armed forces of the state. Um, both images showed unarmed black people, mainly highlighting centering black women in our case, and armed um, white policemen. Not only are they armed with weapons, but they're also wearing protective gear, even though the black women do not possess physical harm to them. And they're also taken into different time periods. This is interesting because the presence of the armed policemen and protecting and protection gear symbolizes the idea that black people do not have true belonging to the state and are not deserving of protection, but actually are seen as a threat to the state and social order. The images on the left was taken during the civil rights period. And if you look closer, like I said, you can see her kind of moving the weapon back, the weapon back from her. This is a form of an explicit mode of resistance. The image on the right was taken more recently, specifically in 2016, during a Black Lives Matter protest. And the person, her name is Aisha Evans, and she purposefully chose to take a stand of resistance um, through her appearance. And this image is an implicit mode of resistance because it shows how her choice of clothing, her dress, her body size, she's pretty thin, um, her straightened hair all implies aspects of femininity and acts and suggests that her hair, um, which is straightened, shows proximity to white femininity, which is seen as a default and therefore more accepted. What is interesting about, um, and this was intentional because her presentation is meant to show that there was less of harm being done to her, but her stance still signifies that she's resisting. Because she's a woman, there's a less chance of them actually trying to, you know, pull the gun towards her face as opposed to the other um, picture. One of the main focus points of this exhibition is the historical component. And even though both images still carry the idea of black women not being not belonging to the state, and as a result, resisting oppression, there's a difference between an explicit and versus implicit mode, aka dressing a certain way to um, relieve harm. But this kind and this contrast signifies the change in ideology of how black women present themselves to fight oppression. And lastly, more of a contemporary example of this one is of Breonna Taylor, who, a, a black woman who was killed, um, tragically murdered in her own home on March 13th, about a, literally over a year ago today. Um, she was unjustly charged for drug dealing operations and the police band finally forced um, their way into her home and killed her without even having to advocate for herself. Her size and race played a big, big part of this as Taylor's tragic death reinforces the idea that black women are seen as, as opposition to the state and are, allow, are not allowed to advocate for themselves. Her size, which deviates from the norm of femininity, demonstrates that she was not worthy of protection from, this, from the state or harm as compared to the previous image when she was much thinner. Um, and the presence of the positive imagery um, of kind of showcasing her smiling, being happy, kind of sh shows as modes of resistance against the way black women are depicted as criminals or angry. And Milana will talk more about the exhibition design layout now. So for our, um, for our uh, art display, we would like to use projection mapping um, to transform like a public space and represent all the narratives we want to show um, in that space. 
Um, this way, it's both something that can be brought to many spaces at once and also be COVID friendly. Um, and we would like to have a projector mounted on the car and then have that projected onto um, different surfaces within buildings. Um, we've picked three locations, which is Ryder Hall, the, um, the Bryan Building, and uh, the Curry Student Center. And then we would also like to have on this car a QR code so that people can scan something and read more about what the art display is about and what we are showcasing um, as a reference to the art that we're going to be showing. And so projection mapping or projection art is using projectors to display images onto a surface. This can be 2D or 3D and you're showing um, videos, images, animations. And so the image on the top left is projected mapping on the <laughs> Sydney Opera Building. Um, and as you can see, it's transformed into something entirely different. And then I don't think we have time, but the bottom is a projected mapping onto a house. Uh, some people like to do this for Halloween as well to transform the house into different things. So there's just a variety of uses from, for projective mapping. Some people do it on shoes, some people do it on statues. Um, it's really limitless. So our goal is to take this technique and use it for our exhibit. Brittany, partial you were video. muted there. Sorry about that. Um, that was just a partial bibliography of the text that we're using. Thank you guys so much and I'm looking forward to questions at the end. Wonderful, thank you, Brittany and Leilana, appreciate that. Um, so our next speaker on panel one will be Olivia Master-Simone from English and Journalism. Okay, sorry, I'm just sharing my screen. All right, hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm presenting a small uh, overview of a project I'm working on with Dr. Cordell um, as my honors in the discipline uh, project. Um, all right, so on April 7th, 1788, the advertisement section of the Middlesex Gazette looked um, incredibly ordinary and uneventful. On this particular Monday, the readers of Middletown, Connecticut's weekly paper might be inclined to purchase some of Andrew Johnson's Madeiran wines or inquire about securing passage on the new sloop Daphne for Boston. Um, and perhaps after reading Dr. John Eli's public service announcement about a successful smallpox inoculation, they would urge their family to receive this rudimentary vaccine. It's very timely, actually. Um, but nestled in within these ordinary community notices, however, um, was a dream. A reader who identified themselves as PM, pun was probably intended, um, wrote a letter to Woodward and Green, the printers of the Middlesex Gazette. This letter contained a personal dream from January 1787 um, and a call for any other reader of this portside paper to interpret it. I'll read a little snippet of it. Um, it reads, Monsieur Printers, as I am a constant reader of your paper, I should be glad if you would insert the following dream. It may seem foolish to some, but I should be glad if somebody would give the interpretations, for to me, it seems to be of great consequence. Sometime in the month of January last, after I had settled the duties of the family, I composed myself to sleep. But in the silent watches of the night, my mind was very much troubled, for I thought that I saw one of the most beautiful ladies in the land. I went towards her, but between her and me, there appeared a large snake. <laughs> it's funny it's very funny this um i'll continue i'll cut it off there you're welcome to finish reading it um just beware the long s's look like f's but they're long s's um so despite pm's urgent call it appeared that a reply was never published um but pm was not alone in their pursuits uh, these letters about dreams and dream interpretations were commonly published in colonial and early American newspapers during the mid to late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and they were printed in a wide variety of papers um, from national to hyperlocal publications, mainly in the Northeast and New England, though there were a few that were published as far south as the Carolinas. Um, and not only are these articles interesting and fun to read, um, but they really represent um, a fascinating tension between 
the public and the private in 18th century American culture. Um, and just an overview on how they even made their way into these publications. Um, they made their way into them fairly simply. A reader often synonymously um, would write their dream in a letter to the printer of their local paper. And during the 18th and early 19th centuries, the uh, printers often function also as the publisher, editor, copy editor, and designer. So they would decide whether or not to include um, these letters in their next editions. And this choice was based on a few important factors. Um, there was relevancy, kind of opportunity for profit, um, and sometimes it's whether or not they needed to fill some space. Um, but most importantly, a lot of these early printers really avoided ruffling any feathers. Um, they wanted to remain relatively impartial. Um, so their, most of the content was pretty much uninflammatory. Um, so in turn, they developed specific styles and conventions to stay in compliance with these principles, um, one of which was synonymous letters, pseudonymous letters um, from readers, uh, which is the form that most of the dreams were printed in. Um, and they were often printed in the advertisement or miscellaneous sections, although some made their way onto the front pages actually. Um, here's a little chart that shows how many there uh, were from the 1730s to the 1850s. I know it doesn't look like a lot, um, but working with historical papers, you have to keep in mind that there's no way to find every single article from every single paper. Um, only a small portion of the papers that existed are archived or accessible. Um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, I couldn't go anywhere in person. So this is what I was able to find. And also a very common practice during um, the 18th and 19th centuries was lifting articles from other people's papers and putting them in yours. So that um, broadens the scope even more because there's really no way to know how far um, this reached. So, um, the existence of these articles uh, just at face value is really interesting and it raises a lot of questions, some of which are like, what are the historical and present or then present day context for the genre? Um, who was reading them and who was writing them? And were they even true? Um, unfortunately, there's no way to answer that last question um, without a time machine. So I can go back and ask this guy if his snake dream was real. Um, but I am digging into some of the culture and context that gave the space for this genre to really flourish. Um, so when you're considering the target audience of these historical publications, which is white, uh, wealthy adult males often involved or interested in shipping, because um, that's what a lot of the local news was about, was about like cargo news and stuff. Um, the presence in these papers is even more interesting and even more uh, like seemingly out of place almost. Um, one answer or rebuttal I have to that uh, starts back about, in the 1600s. About one more minute, Olivia. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I not not doing well in timing. I'm going to skip a little bit, but I'm, I'm basically in my larger project. I'm looking into the relationship between um, Puritans in the 1600s and their approach to news and how that kind of impacted the look and feel of American journalism. Um, but anyway, so papers in the 18th century operated as extensions of public discourse. And I will note I'm using the word public very generously. It only represented a small minority of people which were kind of white male political and social elites. Um, but in that, the conversations that were being had kind of at taverns or pubs were then naturally brought over into papers. So perhaps we can imagine these men discussing dreams about beautiful ladies and snakes at the pub and they wanted second opinions from their community. Um, there's also a lot of these um, dreams that use the medium of a dream as a uh, disguise for social and political critique, um, especially since these papers wanted to remain kind of unbiased. Um, there's a lot that rehash uh, biblical dreams or historical dreams. There's a lot about Nebuchadnezzar from the Old Testament. Um, and there's this one, this one's my favorite. It's about uh, this dream that this guy had that he was a native of the planet Venus. And it's just this really long, thinly veiled critique on monarchy rule. Um, but regardless of what's actually in these articles, they're really valuable. And to me, their value doesn't lie specifically in their content, but rather in the representation of how this small portion of society communicated and what they understood public discourse to be. Um, and they're a strange little piece of early American culture and a window, a window into perhaps the most vulnerable part of our lives, which is sleep. Um, that's it, I'm sorry if I went over. Thank you very much, Olivia.
So we will transition to the final speaker for panel one, which is Kayla Vestergaard from Environmental Studies and International Affairs. Sorry for the technical difficulty. My wife is a little slow, so it takes me a little bit. Um, essentially, um, I worked at the Global Center for Climate Justice for my last co-op, and I worked on a wonderful team with a lot of students um, on this voter suppression and climate justice report, which also has follow-up um, posts for a future blog um, and other things like that. The Global Center for Climate Justice is a nascent organization, um, and we'll be putting out this report in the next few weeks as we launch. So. Um, we started this report because we wanted to explore the relationship between who funds voter suppression and who is suppressed. So on the left, you'll see a timeline. The red is highlighting times when we as a country were racist, sexist, ableist, et cetera, um, and enforcing discriminatory changes. Um, you'll notice that at the bottom, even in 2020, um, and I will update for 2021, there are significant times um, where we continue to show especially systemic racism. And this has impacted a lot of people across the country and prevented um, hundreds of thousands of people from accessing the vote, even in modern day, the way that they ought to be able to. So as Stacey Abrams, who's a voting rights stalwart, you'll see the artwork was done by one of our um, students, Luke Chen. Um, had said after she was told that she couldn't vote because she had already voted, even though she hadn't when she was voting for herself um, for the 2018 governorship of Georgia. Um, she had said, we should not live in a nation where your access to democracy depends on your celebrity, your wealth, or your zip code. She was able to get her right to vote back in that instant, but a lot of people are not. So, um, sorry. Yes. Okay. That's working now. Um, the essential question is what will it take to make our democracy more free and fair? And we wanted to talk about what the landscape of voter suppression, um, and voter expansion efforts looks like right now. So, Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Okay. Um, nationally, we have HR1, which is a suite of voter expansion reforms. It's called the For the People Act. It has forms to stop gerrymandering by implementing independent um, voting commissions, that, as in run by the people, um, as well as take big money out of politics by allowing people to finance campaigns more easily and prevent the corporate influence that happens after Citizens United versus the SEC in 2010. And then a host of other reforms to make it a lot easier to register to vote and make sure that once you cast your ballot, it actually counts. So transparency through the whole process. There's also HR4, which is seeking to restore the 1965 voting rights protections that were gutted in 2013. The decision essentially decided that systemic racism in the voting process was no longer an issue in this country, which is obviously so ridiculous and offensive. Um, and it meant that in 2013, immediately after that decision passed, a host of states rushed to pass voter suppression legislation because they no longer had to be checked by the Department of Justice. I realize I'm speaking a little fast, I'm gonna slow down. Um, that's on the table in the House. It's unlikely, unfortunately, to, fa to pass the Senate. Um, and that's because it would require a majority of votes to end the supermajority for the filibuster. Um, and Joe Manchin III of West Virginia has already said that he is very reluctant to vote to end the filibuster in order to pass even voter suppression, um, anti-voter suppression legislation. Um, but that means that a lot of the power for fighting this monster is up to the states. Um, so interestingly, some of the same states that have passed or have laws in the works to suppress voter legislation are the same legislatures that are seeking to expand it. So there are definitely good and bad actors in the space. Um, but after the voter fraud allegations in the 2020 elections, we saw that there were a lot of difficulties because states thought that they needed to rush to pass in this window of opportunity voter suppression legislation. Um, to capitalize on this fear of voter fraud. Um, 
Reuters was saying that over 50% of Republicans after the election thought that Joe Biden should not have won, that it was an illegitimate election, which is really, really alarming. So we were wondering who was funding this narrative and who was pushing it, particularly because the people who are most likely to have their votes suppressed, according to the Environmental Vote Project, which polls about 20,000 people in 12 states, and they've been expanding, I think they're up to 18 more states now, um, found that people of color, the poor, and the youth are those most likely to have their votes suppressed and those most likely to be the strongest climate voters. Oh, one minute, Kayla. Thank you. Um, so just for a brief overview, um, we were seeing corporate polluters and wealthy donors having their money trickle down. Um, this graph was originally by Lei Nishu Atoko on our team. Um, and so then I just added text to make it a little bit more clear since the zoomed out version is hard to read. Um, if you look, you're, you're going to see different organizations like AstroTurf organizations, for instance, is the term for when an organization poses as grassroots, but they are not actually. Um, and you'll see that uh, a lot of the funding of these specific um, decisions ends up leading to voter suppression. So for instance, like organizations like Freedom Works, which is funded by the Koch brothers, which are oil and gas giants, as well as chemical industry giants, um, ended up funding voter suppression legislation, um, whether it was gerrymandering or voter ID laws is the hot new thing to combat so-called voter fraud. Um, there's voter purging, which has occurred a lot. Um, the Bradleys in Wisconsin are um, manufacturing giants who uh, have been funding ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which uh, has been passing a suite of reforms uh, across the country, kind of copy and paste it into state legislatures to suppress the vote, et cetera. And so the reason all this matters is because if you look, trace back the funding, you'll see that there are corporate interests, particularly fossil fuel interests, that have a lot of interest in terms of trillions of dollars left in the ground of fossil fuels to burn that we can't afford to burn because that would overdo our carbon budget five to six times. And we cannot keep letting this happen. As I was saying earlier, there are some state moves um, to organize and get people involved. And we really need to get people more aware of what's been happening um, and particularly the funding behind it so that we can fight back. I'm finished. Thank you, Kayla. So I want to make sure that we have uh, appropriate time for our second panel. So we will cut this Q&A short, um, but we do have a few minutes for at least a couple of questions. And so um, I, I, I sort of like the very first question we got, which I think applies to many of the uh, papers that we just heard. So this was from Laura Green and was asking, she was asking about how uh, narratives about how reality is described. So discourse has changed over time, but evictions are consistent was the comment that inspired the question. And but the broader question is that it suggests that discourses and counter discourses kind of balance each other out over time. And this seems relevant to many of the papers that we just heard. And I wonder if, if any of our panelists have thoughts about that question. Erin, yes. Yeah, um, so it's an interesting question because it's kind of disappointing to find that at the end of your work, um, but it is kind of true. What I found is that the evictions changed, like the nature of the evictions changed more than they stopped. Um, they became more humane, um, which was good. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a full circle of just running in circles but it is um, a slower march than maybe we'd like to see because they looked at 40 years and it was consistent, but a little bit changed. I, I wanna invite any of other panelists to think about these narratives in, the, in, in that way, narratives and counter narratives. Olivia, you're muted. I think you're speaking. Sorry, I was just reading your question in the chat. <laughs> it was really about is is the moral, as as Dr. Cordell was saying, is the moral of this fact that evictions, you know, don't stop. Does that mean that our narratives have no impact on reality, um, even if they're counter narratives um, or dreams? <laughs> um, or that was sort of what I was curious about. 
and it would certainly also, I think, be a question for Brittany and, and Leilana. Yeah, I'm thinking about the question too, so. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we can move on, we can come back if people want to. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I'm looking over in the chat here. I have one question, it looks like it's for Olivia. Um, you mentioned that there was not a response to the one request for interpretations of dream. Have you found any examples where there are responses or folks trying to interpret the dreams that are being printed in the papers? Absolutely. Um, I found a lot of those. Uh, some of them are very, um, the, the, the reader, the people writing their responses and would be very angry, like they were very heated. Sometimes the conversations would sp like sprawl over many editions. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of, there are a lot of holes in them just because not every edition is always published or um, sometimes one response would have been pulled from another paper so you can't get that original dream that they were responding to. But there were a lot of people who, who wrote in responses. Um, there was one that I remember, well, the guy seemed really interested and was, like asking more questions. He was like, and what do you mean about this horse and who drove you here? So people seem to get really into, into it, um, which I, I really like. <laughs> Thank you. So I've got a new question now for Kayla. What gives you hope in terms of voting rights legislation or organizations in fighting back against the corporate funded efforts that you describe? Yeah, thank you. Um, some of the things that give me hope are the efforts that a lot of grassroots organizers have been putting in for so long in order to fight this. So for instance, Michigan um, had the fastest um, like petition signature run um, that wasn't uh, funded by corporations or the church or the like. Um, and that was for a independent a citizen-led commission. It's 13 people, um, four Democrats, four Republicans, five independents, um, to figure out how to change a state that was historically extremely gerrymandered. So they've been working on that. Um, that really started last year and the pandemic was when it got started and they were announcing who would be on the board, um, random drawing of the people who applied, um, but then for other things too, um, for voter purging. There are people who are suing, um, ACLU um, for another case is now suing Georgia for its voter suppression legislation um, and decisions that Brian Kemp, the governor has been passing. He historically has been very racist um, in his decision-making, but there are so many efforts um, across the country of different true grassroots organizations to expose the funding and who is being harmed by it, um, and particularly states who are rushing to um, push policy that would allow for a broader access to the vote. Thank you, Kayla. So I think we'll probably end with this one, but Dean Poiger has commented that many of you are interested in countering dominant discourses. And she's asked if you can comment on how your coursework might have inspired the research that you're doing in these projects. I can comment on this. And also um, to the earlier point about counter discourses from Lara, um, can, you split, can you describe what you mean by um, evictions again? Sorry. Erin? Um, she was referencing my specific project, but I think she means like, doing bad stuff to people in general um, would be like the, the, the simple way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so like, um, I, I, I would disagree. I would say that discourses and even counter, counter discourses do have an effect, but I do believe like um, maybe not, maybe clearly obviously not as strong as, a, as an effect in my case, in my case, because these stereotypes are so pers persistent today. But I do believe that, um, what well, um, a current conclusion that can be drawn or how can we combat it is that um, through visibility and like obviously censoring marginalized voices so that people can have uh, the space to speak clearly about how, especially black women, how um, these, are, these ideas and representations affect us directly, um, politically and privately as well. And in terms of the kinds of coursework that has helped my research, definitely, um, my current class, I'm taking social and political philosophy with Professor Delmas, and we discussed um, 
feminism um, between a feminist lens and a black feminist lens. And it was a conversation between um, Bell Hooks and her book, Margin the Sender, that, um, that's one of the main books that we talked about in our class. And it was, and it was referencing um, how um, the discourse about feminism was not inclusive of other marginalized voices, especially black women. And that really influenced the kind of the, the approach that I wanted to take as to how we can think critically about the specific, the specific, how the specific experiences of black women inform the larger dynamics of women overall with, with, um, throughout the US. And if anyone wants to add anything to that, um, feel free, but that's just my point. And actually, this is a great place for us to break. We are right at time. And uh, I thank you all so much. And we're going to pass things on to panel two. Thank you, wonderful panel. And thank you, Ryan, for being such an excellent timekeeper. Okay. And is that Dr. Bloom? Yes, it is. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cordell and Dean Poiger and Dr. Green. So welcome to our second panel. And our first speaker who's gonna jump right in and take it away is Liz Marlus, who is from uh, is, is a sociology major. Um, okay, so I am presenting on the BRCA mutation in breast cancer and the impact of intersectionality. Um, my research question is looking at how the intersectional identities of BRCA gene carriers and or cancer survivors impact their experiences with preventative care and decision making regarding their treatment. Um, Professor Blum and her colleague, Dr. Carl Serkan, conducted 15 interviews where they recruited participants from online support groups. Um, that were targeted towards LGBTQ members and people of color, which is really innovative in that it focuses on these marginalized populations and also seeks to understand their experiences during COVID-19. But those details are beyond the scope of this project. So for my approach and methods, I decided to conduct a content analysis of four in-depth semi-structured interviews where I focused my analysis towards questions asked about their diagnosis, um, treatment, family background, and whether they have ever been discriminated against in a medical setting. Demographic questions are also asked towards the end of the interview, which help contribute towards the intersectional framework. And also I decided to take an intersectional approach towards my analysis to consider the complexity of social inequalities and how they are embedded into health disparities to demonstrate how they are not simply explained by just one variable, but when conducting healthcare related research through a sociological lens, qualitative research is useful as it does not mean just comparing minorities' health outcomes to the dominant group's health outcomes, but it takes an in-depth look into their stories that would not be thoroughly explained through just quantitative data. And I chose the four participants, Christine, Mia, MM, and Sai, because they identify as either ethnic racial minorities or as part of the LGBTQ community and all hold the constant variable in that they have all received a higher education degree. And finally, I analyzed their responses using in vivo qualitative analysis software encoded for experiences with genetic testing, shared decision making with providers, and instances where their intersectional identity clearly aligns with their experiences with breast cancer or BRCA. Um, while I have come across some diverse and robust findings, for the sake of time, I will focus on the highlights of each interview that best capture where the participants are clearly impacted by their intersectional experiences. Um, so to start off um, talking about genetic testing, Christine is an African-American bisexual woman with two children, and she describes having about eight relatives from her paternal family that have had cancer and even so, she tested negative for both BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. However, she still developed triple negative breast cancer, an aggressive form of cancer, which affects primarily African-Americans. 
and she would like to receive more genetic testing to find the root cause of her hereditary cancer background for her sons to have knowledge of the risks their future children may have, but her doctor is not very supportive of this at the time. And next on family background and culture, um, Mia is a heterosexual African-American woman with two children. Her family experience with cancer greatly impacted her since her mother had both breast and ovarian cancer, but forewent treatment due to a culture of mistrust of the medical community. She describes that having grown up in Alabama near where the Tuskegee syphilis experiments took place was influential in her family members not seeking treatment for their medical problems and staying silent about their illnesses. She similarly also delayed getting tested for BRCA until she was 40, year, 40 years old and developed cancer shortly after testing positive for BRCA1. But she wants to break out of this cycle of medical distrust and silence in her community. Next, regarding lack of data and information, um, Sai is a transgender non-binary person who developed ovarian cancer and did not test positive for either BRCA mutations, but has another mutation called Lynch syndrome. Um, Sai felt that having to advocate for themselves as a non-binary individual receiving care at a major hospital was emotionally taxing for them as doctors could not offer information on how surgically induced menopause would affect them differently as a non-binary person and that they then had to go seek out alternative treatment um, to manage their symptoms on their own. And they felt that most of the time they were doing more of the teaching when they went to see their doctor versus just being a patient. And finally, with regard to shared decision-making, um, MM is a lesbian woman who is BRCA2 positive and has taken preventative measures by having both a mastectomy and hysterectomy. She had a negative experience with her mastectomy where she clearly expressed to her surgeon that she wanted a flat mastectomy, saying that she wanted to be flat as a pancake when she woke up and she was not um, flat when she woke up and was instead left with excess skin. Um, when she confronted her surgeon about this, he said that he intentionally left her that way because he figured she would change her mind and want um, breast implants later on. He was concerned about her inability to wear bikini tops or blouses, despite her clearly saying earlier that she did not even wear that kind of clothing and it wasn't a concern for her. So this was a clear disregard um, of her preferences and she shortly had to go in with another surgeon to receive a revision to this botched surgery. One minute. Okay. Um, so some of the takeaways of this, of these interviews are that um, they help to shed light on a subset of the BRCA and cancer patient population that is not widely discussed. Um, while there is much awareness of breast cancer in the media due to celebrities being open about their experiences as BRCA gene mutation carriers, other research has not focused on the experiences of racial minorities and of the LGBTQ community. Um, understanding personalized experience, experiences within healthcare settings will help us to understand how policy and hospital level changes can be implemented in order to accommodate the needs of those of diverse backgrounds and life experiences. And this topic is of special importance to me as I will go on to pursue my graduate level studies in public health policy and management and plan to focus on mitigating the health disparities present within our healthcare system. Okay. Yep, that's it, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and next we have Caitlin Airy Lee, who is also a sociology major. Hi everyone. So my topic is called Dating at a Distance, um, Navigating Sexual and Romantic Relationships and Emotional Intimacy During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, my research question was formulated as an offshoot of Professor Blum's longitudinal study on young adult experiences in the pandemic. Um, and I'll be focusing particularly on if dating and hookup culture have changed in the COVID-19 pandemic, and also if there will be lasting long-term changes after the pandemic is over. 
So in terms of methodology, I'll be drawing on 40 qualitative interviews that Professor Blum had conducted for her um, larger study. Um, these questions concern broader topics of young adult experiences in the pandemic, um, with one section focusing on significant others and relationships in the pandemic. So I'll be drawing on that data as well. Um, and then I conducted five supplemental interviews with participants that had also participated in that first round of interviews with Professor Blum. Um, for some contextual data, I want to offer that three people had just broken up with their significant other at the time of their first round interview, two people had described actively dating, um, and 21 people were in relationships. And at the time of the initial 40 interviews, four people had started their relationships in the pandemic. But after um, I did my five supplemental interviews, two of the re-interviewed participants had also started relationships um, since their first interview. And the remaining 14 were single at the time. So One of my suggestive findings is that there seems to be a shift in the calculation of risk um, from a gendered risk assessment concerning sexual violence or harassment before the pandemic to a more balanced risk assessment concerning COVID-19 exposure in the pandemic. Um, so women had described that before the pandemic, they would often have to strategize about how to safely meet and date new people that they didn't necessarily know very well. Um, women had said that they had to worry more about violence, being prepared for something risky to happen, thinking that a guy would make her go home with him, describing wanting to be able to escape if they're bad news, and never knowing if someone was going to be too aggressive. Um, they also described that they wanted to make sure that their friends knew that they were meeting new people, and one of my participants, Elizabeth, who is a queer white woman, said that while she prefers to keep her dating life private, she feels that it's too dangerous if she goes on dates without telling her friends. Um, another interviewee, E.H., who is a straight white woman, described how men have the power in deciding how a relationship progresses sexually and emotionally. And while the woman I interviewed described these experiences in more detail, the men I interviewed, um, one gay man, um, gay white man, and one straight Asian American man also acknowledged that these gendered experiences exist. So in the pandemic, the risk for women is minimized because they're taking more time to see if potential partners are worth meeting up in person. Um, some had described taking more preliminary steps before planning to meet in close proximity, like texting or messaging for longer, doing FaceTime or Zoom dates, or doing more public activities, like going on walks or distance picnics before having more intimate or typical date activities, like a dinner and drinks or a movie at home. Um, sorry. Um, a couple of interviewees had said that the person that they were going to meet had to be worth the risk of meeting in person and that their standards were higher and their potential partner's level of COVID cautious behavior um, was a big aspect um, in the decision to meet in person. And so they described that their ideas of how to be COVID cautious had to align. Um, and Elizabeth had said that one of the co that the COVID preferences on dating apps were very helpful for filtering for people that she might want to talk to. Um, and interviewees had described that these conversations about COVID safety happened with men and women, both initiating and taking part in those conversations. Um, Shira, a bisexual white woman, had described a three-step process for dating in the pandemic. So starting with a phone call, then a, then a walk with masks on, um, physically distance, and then an activity that felt, quote, risk reductionist, but is more datey and interesting. Uh, so as you can see, before the pandemic, these risk calculations or assessments happened mostly by women, among women, with women telling their other women friends that they were going on dates, et cetera, um, to happening all amongst men and women in conversations about both people's levels of COVID cautious behavior. Um, so I think an important takeaway is that the interviewees from the inter supplemental interviews were hopeful that some of these dating, um, COVID dating practices would carry over and create healthier and safer dating hookup experiences after the pandemic. So many people had emphasized that taking a longer duration of time or doing FaceTimes or phone calls before meeting in person for the first time were things that they would hope continued beyond the pandemic. 
A couple of interviewees had emphasized that a five or 10 minute um, FaceTime or phone call um, helps to know someone on a different level than just texting or messaging and can help them better decide if the person is someone that they would want to meet in person. So one of my participants, EH in particular, had very strong views on this, saying that these COVID dates, um, like going to the park or doing an activity in public, allows you to get to know someone better than a traditional dinner or drinks or a movie day at someone's house. Um, and as you can see from the quote, she also feels that these practices might make dating or hookup culture safer because if people what normalize, okay, thank you. Um, because if people normalize um, FaceTime dates or getting to know someone better um, before meeting them, it could take the pressure off of girls to stay on dates that they aren't enjoying or to go home with someone that they might not want to continue seeing. So it continues the worth the risk mentality, but it's kind of shifted towards worth your time mentality. Um, and there was also hope that these practices would minimize the risk of something going wrong um, since there was more time taken to get to know the potential partner before meeting in person. And to conclude, I want to point to a broader preliminary takeaway. Um, there is a lot of existing sociological research exploring physical and emotional harm in hookup culture. Um, and I think that some of the thoughts of my interview participants highlighted here suggest that perhaps a normalization of, the, of these pandemic dating experiences may lessen the concern of these negative aspects of hookup culture overall. Um, so that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Charlotte Mulika who um, actually it's her minors that are listed on the program. And I am very happy to say she is also a sociology major. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Malika and I am zooming in from Boston. And I will be presenting today on the intimate relationship between white democracy and black plunder. I've, decided, I've dedicated my undergraduate education to trying to gain a better understanding of the persistence of anti-Black racism and what our history truly means. Through my academic journey, I found that the more I educated myself on the history of white supremacy in America, the more I came to understand how, how and why inequalities exist throughout the country today. Understanding the root cause of inequality gives us as citizens more agency to make social change and create a more fair and loving world that we all wish to be a part of. I think it's one thing to know American history, but it's another thing to understand how that history sets up the institutions and system, systems normalized today. My passion to gain a better understanding of white supremacy influenced me to work at the Black Archives History and Research Foundation in Overtime, Overtown, Miami, Florida, archiving Black history my freshman year of college at the University of Miami. My sophomore year of college, I transferred to Northeastern University so I could put experimental, experiential learning at the focal point of my undergraduate education. Last semester, I co-opted the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project as well as the Brudnick Center on Conflict and Violence. And at the CRRJ, I investigated cold cases of racial violence and studied the extent of white violence throughout history, which was given immunity and nearly forgotten. At the Brudnick Center on Conflict and Violence, I conducted my own research exploring why the promotion of individualism and relying on the natural mechanisms of capitalism to create racial equality was in line with the political agenda of white supremacy. When I finished my literature review, I was honestly left with more questions than answers. This semester, I'm taking an economics course taught by Dr. Venka Tessin, which has truly begun to answer a lot of the questions I've had throughout my whole academic journey. The answer I've found is the monopolization of capital production. The persistence of anti-Black racism has always been fueled by the desire to maintain capital production among white Americans. According to Du Bois in his work, Black Reconstruction, he stated that the system of capitalism allows for economic decisions to be politically charged to be in favor of some groups over others. A capitalistic system under white supremacy historically allowed economic decisions to be politically charged to favor white wealth accumulation at the expense of human beings and the environment. When I learned about slavery and anti-Black racism growing up, the pedagogy 
mainly focus on the inhumane treatment of black people rather than about the construction of race as a means for white people to accumulate more wealth. I was told about colored only signs and unequal services. I was told about progress through the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. What I wasn't told about was how a theory of racial hi hierarchy was used to justify the exclusion of black people from capital production, which pretty much excluded black people from the core me mechanism of capitalism. I was not told that the majority of black people who experienced racial violence in the reconstruction era, era were those who managed to produce capital. Black people who purchased land were especially vulnerable to violent acts. The 1921 Tulsa race massacre is a great example of the threat ambitious black people opposed to the political agenda of white supremacy. The massacre took place in the Greenwood district in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, which was one of the most prominent concentrations of black businesses in the United States in the early 20th century. This area was known as the Black Wall Street and many historians point to the economic prosperity of black Americans for what fueled the massacre. The stereotypes and discrimination of black people root from the long lasting history of distorting American ideologies to prioritize white wealth accumulation. Today, these stereotypes are still used to profit for white corporations, which further perpetuates the racial wealth gap and justifies the subjugation of black Americans. Today, innocent black Americans are killed while they're, killed while they're as home asleep in their bed, while walking home, while sleeping in their car, while eating Skittles, while doing any innocuous task just because of the color of their skin. Today, black women are far more likely to die from childbirth than any other race. Today, one in three black men are locked up in their lifetime. Today, more black Americans have come into contact with the criminal justice system than there were enslaved people in the 1850s. This constant discrimination, unequal treatment in services and exclusion from capital production has led to the inability for many black Americans to accumulate wealth. Today, white households living near the poverty line typically have about $18,000 in wealth while black households living near the poverty line typically have a medium wealth near zero. The, ra the racial wealth gap that we see today has remained largely the same since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. In 1863, the black community owned 0.5% of the wealth in the United States. And 150 years later, the black community only owns 1% of the wealth in the United States. Intergenerational wealth among white Americans today illuminates this country's egregious history and lends to the argument of the dire need for the redistribution of wealth and reparations for black Americans. According to William Darity and A. Kirsten Mullen, leading scholars on the discussion of reparations for black Americans, reparations must consist of acknowledgement, redress, and closure. According to Darity, one, one minute, sorry, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> According to Darity and Mullen, the new and approved reparations program in Evanston, Illinois, which is the first reparations program in this country, is merely a housing voucher and not a true reparations program. Reparations must not only consist of a monetary value, but must change cultural values, which have consistently prioritized the capital production for white Americans at the expense of the livelihood of Black Americans. It is one thing for me to sit here in front of you all today and talk about race, but it is another thing to actively work towards dismantling the American institutions which perpetuate the unequal treatment of Black people. Individualism is not the answer. The natural mechanisms of capitalism, of capitalism are not the answer. These are the answers to perpetuating the system exactly how it started. We all have a stake in this problem and it is our responsibility to not only understand our history, but to understand how our history sets up the world we see today in order to know how to fully and how to truly change it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And our last presenter today is Kaylin Boston, um, who is a philosophy major. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, one sec. All right. Is that uh, that work? I think so. All right. So the the uh, the uh, the subject that I'm going to be presenting on today is uh, called the uh, epistemic limitations of uh, administrative law. The sort of 
research question that I, uh, I set out to investigate is, um, you know, to what extent has administrative law displaced local problem solving um, in our society? Um, so the sort of thesis that I've triangulated um, is that uh, universal epistemologies have been advanced at the expense of um, proximal epistemologies through the development of the administrative state. Um, now, just to unpack this, um, you know, an epistemology is a set of propositions um, in a an epistemology is, is, is said to be universal um, if it is a set of propositions whose truth values are independent of particular time, place, circumstances. Um, conversely, an epistemology is said to be proximal insofar um, as it is a set of propositions which are dependent on particular time, place, and circumstances. So that the methodology that I, uh, I drew from in this, uh, in this investigation um, was uh, law and economics. Um, it's fairly widely recognized discipline at this point. Um, and the sort of presuppo presupposition that the doctrine operates upon um, is that the common law conforms to an economic logic. Um, what I think sets the investigation apart, um, sort of methodology part two, um, is that I use Austrian economics as opposed to sort of orthodox neoclassical um, economics. Um, so the Austrian school is interesting. Um, it's fairly heterodox, not very much accepted by uh, by mainstream thought, but um, it is epistemic in nature. It sort of discards with um, a lot of the allocative um, assumptions made in the the orthodox tradition. Um, and furthermore, it actually uh, it, you know it, it, it sort of rejects um, empirical evidence as a means of obtaining um, economic truths. Um, so you know the the Austrian school does not think that one can um, you know observe trends in history or run statistical tests to uh, confirm economic truths, rather one, one begins with a set of first principles um, and via deductive logic um, reasons towards, towards economic truths. Um, so I think the, the sort of case that I wanted to um, go through today um, that is sort of illustrative of, um, of, this, of this thesis that I've, 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 um, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've come, to, come to believe um, is a case called USV uh, Florida East Coast Railway. Um, so, uh, so sort of complex fact pattern, but um, on the whole, the, the United States had a, had a history of a, sort of a chronic freight car shortage um, during the 1960s. Um, the ICC set out um, on a semi harebrained scheme to um, establish what the appropriate per diem rates were for rail cars across the entire United States. Um, now, the, the, um, the ICC ended up um, ended up uh, establishing these rates without holding a, a hearing for opposed parties. Um, consequently, uh, the, the East Coast felt that it was uh, prejudiced by the ICC, um, took them, proceeded to take them to court. Um, the sort of, uh, you know, United States uh, District Court of, of the middle, middle District of Florida ruled that the railroads were in fact uh, prejudiced by the ICC. Um, and the ICC was found in failure of compliance with, um, with the APA. Uh, the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, the Supreme Court went on to to uh, you know reverse this reverse this decision, um, and you know regardless of the substantive outcomes, um, the sort of procedural outcome um, was that formal rulemaking, um, as it was outlined in the Administrative Procedures Act, was effectively killed. It's basically a non-starter in the uh, discipline of admin law these days because uh, nobody nobody really uses it, and this is problematic for proximal epistemologies um, because of uh, sort of the following. And I, kind of outline um, sort of a uh, inst this sort of institutional arrangements um, which would have been used to solve this problem in sort of our classical uh, commercial republic um, and then sort of in a post Florida regime. So you can sort of go through these um, um, kind of qualitative uh, qualitative categories. Um, epistemologically speaking, um, it would have been sort of like a contractual arrangement between um, between the parties, um, you know, allocating the, the rail cars and that utilizing the rail cars. Um, on the level of coercion or, you know, violence, it was limited just to state powers as opposed to sort of federal powers. Um, and the contracts, uh, temporally speaking, were, were enforced ex post, right? So um, it, was not, it was not prior, uh, prior to the transaction, thus it remained a private transaction. Um, and via the, via the COS theorem, we can, we can determine that, um, you know, the, the outcome was efficient on the whole. Um, the COS theorem sort of property rights formulation is that in the presence of a negative externality, um, and with relatively low transaction costs, two, two bargaining parties will arrive at Pareto efficient outcomes um, uh, if, if they are allowed to bargain, um, permitted to bargain. Um, so if we look at the sort of post-Florida solution, um, it's sort of different. 
um, you know, it's not necessarily clear on an epistemological level um, whether or not, uh, you know, proximal knowledge is used, but certainly since um, federal powers define these rules ex ante, um, you know, universal knowledge was certainly utilized um, and thus it becomes a public regulation as opposed to a private transaction. Um, and finally, the, the outcome is indefinite um, as per the sort of Misesian calculation problem. It cannot be determined uh, whether or not the outcome is efficient. Um, and just speaking in terms of conclusions, um, you know, the, the methodology I think overall was unique. We sort of went through a number of um, you know, cases and laws from, I think it's 18, 1887 up to 2010, sort of ending with the whole Abigail Alliance uh, situation. Um, and it, it really shed a new light um, utilizing these categories that are not typically permitted in, in mainstream academic institutions. Um, and the uh, sort of investigation certainly suggests that it, um, you know, universal epistemologies were advanced at the expense of proximal. Um, and I think one, uh, one further question one has to ask is, you know, how is this sort of connected um, to these? One minute. Oh, sure. Um, so the sort of substantive question one, one, may, one may go on to ask is, you know, to what extent um, are these sort of uh, concerning macro indicators of declining productivity growth, lack of business dynamism and stagnant real wages um, connected to, to this um, sort of relegation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, proximal epistemologies? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we do have a bit of time, thanks to our audience. It's, been, it's a lot of time to stay on Zoom, we know, but we do have some time, a few minutes for questions if um, you'd like to put any into the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, I had a question actually, which any of the panelists or everyone on the panel could speak to. I just wondered if you had the opportunity to continue your project um, or revise it in some way, what would you um, what would you do? Um, Charlotte, like yeah, Charlotte has a thought. Yeah, Charlotte, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm actually applying for a Peak Award to continue my research and to look into Evanston's reparations program more in depth and try uh, kind of articulate why there needs to be a more all encompassing program rather than the program that is put in place. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else on the panel? I can also answer, I think um, obviously, given the time restraints, I, I was only able to focus on so much, but I think an important aspect that I'd like to expand upon are um, like racial or class differences in dating experiences in the pandemic. Um, I think it's really important to include those intersectional lenses that I know a lot of um, the other panelists had focused on. So um, if I have the opportunity, that's something I would definitely like to do. Mm -hmm. Great. And I do see some questions in the yeah. chat now. Yeah, I do. Um, so we have a question for Kaylin. How do we move past the administrative state? Then e even your even your presentation. I'm not quite sure, but given, Maybe your, given, your, presentation? given your presentation, how do we move past the administrative state given your presentation? Um, uh, sure. Uh, I, it's, it's not really clear how, how one, um, you know, moves past this. Um, there's a lot of deregulation that needs to occur for that to happen. And it's, it's, it's really unclear. Um, you know, there, there, there's certainly like a Spanglerian, uh, decline of the West, uh, sort of underpinning the, underpinning the investigation. Um, but you know, it's sort of a non-answer, but, um, it's, it's actually just not, not clear how, how we actually get past this. You know, just to sort of address um, Professor Bloom's question, um, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, just to just to address Professor Bloom's question, um, and you know, sort of bringing in your question, um, you know, I, I I think that on the whole, there's a lot that can be done in the in the domain of technologies um, that that can sort of integrate local information um, to create you know new and visionary things, um, and I, I it's probably something probably something around technology could, could help us get us get past this. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Let's talk another question for anyone on the panel. How do you see your research translating into your professional career after Northeastern? Well, I can kind of answer this just because I mentioned at the end of my presentation, um, kind of going on to pursue um, a master's in public health. Um, so that I'm, I'm planning on doing that in the fall. Um, and I guess so far, like all of the research and experience that I've gained in general while being at Northeastern has been very helpful. Um, just from understanding, I guess, all of the factors that are at play when it comes to um, just like the healthcare system and health disparities. And I think the qualitative research methods and, and also some quantitative that I have done are like the most important things that I'll take on with me. Um, and also having the sociological lens along with it um, will be very important for that. Great. Anyone else on the panel want to speak to that? Um, well, I mean, I, I sort of hinted at this, but um, you know, I think I think that uh, I'm very interested or very compelled in in uh, by the sort of technology industry. Um, you know, I sort of started out in philosophy because you know you you look at sort of the history of of what we accomplished um, in terms of uh, you know with with our on a political level, right? We had the Manhattan Project, we had the Apollo Program, even the the Human Genome Project, in in, in sort of the early two thousands. But, uh, you know, sort of during my time investigating, um, you know, sort of philosophy, um, you know, that sort of interest has, has, has remained around, you know, large, large substantive things that I think uh, humanity can accomplish. Um, but it certainly, it certainly moved more, I guess, to the sort of private sector and what we can do in the, what we can do in the technology industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I can answer that as well. I think like Liz, I also hope to continue my education after I graduate from undergrad. Um, and I also hope to do some kind of research or policy um, in my career. And while maybe it's not topic specific to the presentation I had today, I think um, a lot of the methods that I have learned and just the exposure to um, other aspects of research, like grant writing or writing the proposal even for this forum um, have been really helpful in gaining some insight into what that um, academic space looks like. Very good, okay. Um, I also probably will extend my education past undergraduate school and I could see myself maybe going to law school, be a civil rights lawyer, or maybe going to graduate school for economics or journalism, I would be really interested in being a journalist for like the Atlantic or Washington Post or something like that. Excellent. And we have a new question. Okay. Um, for anyone on the panel who included race ethnicity in their project, how do we begin understanding the factors embedded in your research through a non homogenous school of thought. Here I am thinking, how do all as researchers extend beyond the Rawlsian school of thought lens when proceeding with the justice question? Okay. And of course, not everybody on the panel no, was... may be a political philosopher. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but that question, but certainly the first part of the question of sort of what, how do you understand race and ethnicity as they appear in your project? Maybe do you think, Linda, we could work with that? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's a good question. Would any of our panelists like to speak to that? Liz's project was so focused on intersectionality that it, it seems like you might have something interesting to say about that. Um, I would say this is something I think about a lot just because I, I always think about like how we kind of can expand what we're trying to say beyond like academia. Um, and 
for me personally, I am very interested in like community based participatory research um, and kind of like engaging the community in, in what we do and sort of like empowering them um, to pursue advocacy through like the information that we're collecting. Um, so that's kind of like one way that I like to look at it and kind of like have hope for the future of like our understanding of race and ethnic relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I was wondering if the question could be reworded. I think I'm a little confused by the question. Well, I think in your case, Charlotte, it, it, you mean you're particularly interested in anti-Black violence and white supremacy. And so I'm not sure in a sense that that question applies in the same way. Um, because that is a, such an important focus. Um, I don't know, you know, if you want to say more about, you know, one could think of comparing to other forms of, other forms, you know, of um, diversity and other forms of um, race and ethnic violence. Can I throw in a suggestion, Charlotte, and see see if this gets gets this anywhere? It seems to me that the question is partly about the fact that sometimes we forget that race or ethnicity are contested categories, right? They're not just things that are out there, or we use different lenses on them. And as I think about the, the two different or the various different presentations, what's interesting about yours, Charlotte, is I think it's really, you're not, you're really talking about race as a historical category, right? As it was um, and an economic category, maybe with these particular historical effects, right? And a kind of traceable narrative more so than maybe, I mean, at one point you sort of said, I'm not, and I'm really paraphrasing here, right? But like, I learned all this stuff about how people felt and how people were mean to them, but I didn't learn about how structurally they were actually blocked from accessing certain kinds of, of social goods. Is that, does that seem like a fair paraphrase that, that you're working with one conception of race and maybe less emphasis on another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, yeah, if you want to add anything to that. Because you're not a historian, are you? And yet history seems so important to your. Economic liberties. Is it, it like asking how economics will bring to justice or how that will add to justice? Is that the question? Um, I feel like economic liberties that's one aspect of justice and that could help or just for example entrepreneurs need money in order to start businesses they need that money to begin to start their own businesses so i think that would be um i think that economics could add to creating more black businesses that are successful and that it's a and plus economics, there also needs to be a cultural shift in cultural values and the way that um, racism is seen and um, and there it's there's I think there's multiple parts more than economics that need to be addressed when in terms of uh, justice and reparations in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, we're right around at time. So do you want to give a closing thought, uh, Dr. Green? I think I will turn things back to Dr. Poiger to close us out. I do want to, as I know, she will thank all of our panelists, guests, and excellent moderators. These were really wonderful and thought-provoking papers. Dr. Poiger? Thank you, Dr. Green. And, um, hmm. Okay, I guess I'm having an astonishing number of Zoom messages here, but it's been really um, a pleasure to um, hear the 
um, range of papers that you have given on um, really important and compelling um, issues. Um, many of them, as I think has been pointed out by the questioners, as well as by you, um, related to questions of how we tackle issues of equity in um, today's world, and um, at the same time, how those issues of equity intersect with questions of health. Um, but also um, questions about how we, what the status of um, different fields of inquiry is in today's world. So I think you've really raised a lot of complex issues for further thought. I'm really inspired also by the ways in which you are thinking about your paths and your passion for continuing on with the work that you have started. So I wanna again, thank all the panelists, all the moderators for coming together today and wish all of you a good rest of the semester wish all of us um, that we continue to stay safe. And um, again, look forward to seeing you in other contexts on Zoom or hopefully at some point also in person. So with that, I think we'll say bye-bye for today. Thank you so much. <laughs>